Well, welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Um, today we're going to do something that I'm not really very interested in, to be honest, but I'm doing it because this may well interest other people. And having said that, there may be a link between this and 3D engraving. So maybe I will learn something from it. What we've got on the screen is some test text, as it clearly says. And you'll notice that I've got different layers set up for the same thing. The plan is we're going to do some experiments with uh, a feature called ramp. If we take a look at the blue layer, if we work to the bottom here, you'll see it's one of the options. You only get this option if you select scan. So if I select cut, all those options disappear. If I use scan, I get several options down here depending on what sort of scanning I'm doing. If I bring in a bitmap then some of these other options come in but because this file is in a, in a vector format um, I only get these two choices. Now I don't know what independent output is. I've never worked that out. It seems to want to um, connect up to my PC in some way but ramp effect is something that I've never played with. I've seen the pictures in the manual but I've never really tried to work out what ramp effect is. Um, but today we're going to set this blue layer up at quite a high speed, 200 millimeters a second, and we're going to set it with a minimum speed and a maximum speed. Now these min and max speeds that I've got on here are the min and max for my machine. I'm going to select the ramp effect and I'm going to set a ramp length of 1. We'll do the same thing for the red layer and I've already set the red layer up to 14 and 65 and 200 millimeters a second and I've set the ramp effect but this time I've set the ramp length to 2. Now 2 is going to be really unrealistic. Let me just explain why. If we look at this text here the width of the text is actually only one millimeter and so the spacing between the text here is well in places it's a lot less than two millimeters so the actual ramps are likely to overlap with each other and it's going to look a bit of a mess I suspect. Now we've got two types of text on here we've got this text at the top which is in a box and this text at the bottom which is not in a box. Now what's going to happen is this text in the box is going to engrave in the background and I'm expecting ramps to occur at the bottom of the T there like the buttresses on a castle for example um, and yet this one I'm expecting to cut down the center of the letters only but with a set of these buttresses internally which technically will overlap because the letter is only one millimeter wide therefore the, the, the actual buttresses themselves or the ramps can only be half a millimetre wide and they will produce a V down the centre of each one of these lines. Now the green text I'm setting up slightly differently. Yes we've got 200 millimetres the same, we've set the same scan speed but this time what I've done I've set the power to equal so I shall get no grayscale effect. The power will either be on or off and technically I'm expecting that to make the ramp ineffective because the ramp requires variable power to activate. Now I've set the ramp length to three millimeters. It's a silly dimension I know but I do want to see whether it has any effect at all. And then finally for this pink layer what we've done speed 200 again scan we're back to max and min. But this time I've got no ramp selected and zero ramp length obviously. So basically we're doing straight engraving here but we're using variable power. I don't expect this to do a great deal other than just engrave. There's a possibility that because this 14% here it might have a little bit of a ramp effect in the corners at the bottom as it starts and finishes its cut. We'll have to wait and see. Now there's really no point in us going out to the machine and you watching me run these tests. You've seen me use the machine many times before so let's jump straight into the results that I got. 
Now this is the first test where we were expecting to see a one millimetre ramp. Now I'm going to just magnify the picture a little bit for you. And I think you can clearly see along the bottom here the little ramp that's actually been induced. Now this is basically must be done with uh, like grayscale engraving where the power is being varied because something has been introduced into the software to increase and decrease the power as it traverses across the scan. In the same way if we look carefully at the other version if we catch it in the light just right I think you can clearly see right down the center here that there is a like a V notch so the two ramps are overlapping on the inside of this letter we've got a one millimeter ramp on each side but of course the letter is only one millimeter wide so technically we're only going to finish up with a half millimeter ramp on each side because they're going to overlap so just for reference what I want you to do is to look at where this ramp settles underneath the top of the T you'll see that it comes down and there's it stops quite a long way from the end here there's the end of the T and yeah we ideally this ramp should be the width of the T away from the T itself because it's a one millimeter ramp and a one millimeter wide letter so let's go and have a look at the two millimeter ramp and see whether we can see any difference when we look at the T well yeah I suppose we can it isn't significantly different I suppose the depth of the cut is not quite as deep and the T tends to come away probably halfway along the bar of the T so it's probably a bit more than one millimeter so yeah it's having a small effect but it's not that obvious and when we look at the letter I suppose we can still see the V effect down the center of the letter but it's much more of a curve now um, it's not as well defined but to be honest I can't see that that makes any difference to the letters you know if you want indented letters why would you bother to put the ramp on you just do an engraved letter and you would get this so I can't see what the advantage of having a ramp internally or externally does for the letters now the next combination was a strange combination if you remember where we set the power to minimum and maximum and we still had a ramp like a three millimeter ramp this time but I think you can see clearly we're having no effect at all there's no ramp on that result and because it's only set to 30% the depth of the cut is fairly uniform so although this final version was done with variable power ie 14% and 65% um, to be honest it really doesn't look a lot different than the one millimeter ramp there looks to be a small amount of ramping there but that's probably caused by as the beam switches on and off it goes through this 14% before it switches up to 65% and gets full power on so again I'm asking the question just how valid is this ramp effect it can be seen but I can't see that there's much value and when we look at these indented letters they look quite crisp and clean in the bottom they don't look as though they've got any ramping effect in them at all so although the effect is quite nice I think you'll find that uh, just straightforward engraving will achieve the same results yet to be convinced of what the benefit of having the ramp effect is um, so maybe some of the more professional guys that use this all the time will tell me where I'm going wrong and where I'm not seeing its advantage no. I was saying that there's probably a relationship between this work and 3d engraving because sure enough we have effectively got 3d engraving here and 
If we take a look in the background again, we'll see that we've got some of my old problems. So if we catch in the in the right light, I think you can clearly see that we've got a very distinctive wavy effect as we go along here. You know, it's a ripple. It looks just like a curtain hanging down with all its ripples in it. And it's very uh, uniform in its pattern. I think you can see the vertical lines going up just here. Now it's nothing to do with the text itself because as this is scanning backwards and forwards at the top here it doesn't know anything about this text and vice versa at the bottom. So this again must be something to do with the stepper motor in some way shape or form I would expect. Now I say I would expect because very shortly I'm going to be taking delivery of another machine. And this other machine has got servo-driven systems on it. So when I get that machine up and running, we should be able to observe comparisons between stepper motors and servo motors to find out whether this rippling effect that's in the background of uh, 3D engraving is it anything to do with the steppers as we suspect it is, or whether it's some other feature of the software. Well, I've now drawn two lines on here and the, re the reason why I was trying to relate this work to the work that I did with 3D engraving was if you remember when I was doing my 3D engraving tests, what was happening was the beam was switching on and it was switching on at the same time as the stepper motor was starting to accelerate. And so consequently at this point just here, we were getting two or three or four very distinctive what looked like gear teeth steps as the motor accelerated up to speed and then it stopped and then we came back and we scanned it we were only doing unidirectional scans to emphasize the fact but when I was doing this test each one of these tests is a separate test because they're on different layers what was happening was for example with this particular test the the beam was starting, sorry, the head was starting here for a scan and it was running all the way across and stopping here at the end of the scan and then running back. Now that meant that it was over traveling at the end of each scan and then it was light on, light off, over travel, accelerate back up to speed, light on, light off and decelerate and then accelerate back up to speed, light on, etc. So this cogging effect that we were seeing before was actually taking place off of the job before the beam switched on, which is why we don't see it in this particular instance. So I've got to go back and find out just what it was that I was doing with the grayscale picture that made this come onto the picture itself. I walked back into my workshop to see the scariest sight you could ever imagine. Now that was a very bad experience for me. I just want you to take note of that and uh, we'll have a look to see exactly what the damage is. I've cleaned out the ashes from this area because the flames are in this area here. Apart from some smoke damage in places, um, some scorching here, um, we've destroyed the belt. Yep. The belt caught the flames. We've done a little bit of damage here to the uh, to the slide, but nothing too bad, I don't think, that we can't fix. Um, it has answered a question that I always wanted to know. I wonder what the fibres are in this belt. And the answer is, they are glass fibre. So, a new belt is required. And a clean-up of the slides. We're very lucky that we've done no damage to any of the electrics or any of the any of the uh, mirrors, I don't think. There may be some smoke damage to the mirror there, but that's easily fixed. Nothing else was in the way. And, um, and apart from some smoke damage up here on the lid, I think I'm a very, very, very lucky boy. Well, here we can see the cause of the fire. This is very lightweight plywood. Um, it's 10 millimeters thick but obviously when I cut the corner out around here and I did that manually I had far too much power 
for the speed and must have somehow started embering underneath here. Now when I walked away from the machine to go and clean the uh, to clean the sample up I did turn the, uh, the extraction off so there was no air passing through here so walking away from this for five seven minutes this wood turned into a little bonfire as I said before I'm a very lucky boy because it could have been another 10 minutes and in which case things would have been substantially worse.